Welcome to The Law Matters. Of course it does. Hi, I'm Debbie Morais, your host and moderator. This program has been created, as you know, to educate, inform, and help you with The Law Matters because The Law Matters. Understand the law better, and you're in a better position to decide how to protect yourself, your family, and your business. We continue to provide info information and resources to help you decide whether you need or want to contact a lawyer. Perhaps we'll help you determine that you can handle some issues yourself. If you do need to contact outside professional counsel, they'll be better prepared. And as a result, hopefully, you will achieve better results, save time, and save money. That's our goal. The Bazaar and Associates Law Firm in East Providence continue to help us with the ta issues we tackle. Welcome, welcome David. David Bazaar from Bazaar and Associates. and Associates Law Firm. So today's topic is taken from recent headlines. It's a tragedy. Is it really a crime? A woman named Michelle Carter was convicted of involuntary manslaughter on June 16th of this year for sending her boyfriend text messages encouraging him to commit suicide. Her boyfriend, his name was Conrad Roy III, um, killed himself on July of 2014. So initially you might say that our topic is about is about whether or not, what the First Amendment is about, and a person's right to free speech. So while freedom of speech in the United States is a uh, right protected by the Constitution, there are exceptions that make the right somewhat limited. We'll discuss those a little bit, perhaps a little bit more than we usually do. But also the case brings into question a law that criminalizes encouraging or assisting suicide. So what are the legal implications, which is what we tackle here? So did she have a significant coercive role in that teenager's suicide? Lots to discuss here. And of course, as of this taping, the case has been decided, but it's on appeal, which I think is going to happen for a while. So David. Sure. First Amendment. I can tell you to jump off the bridge. How is this different and what's going on with this? Well, there's a number of times where it's not a question of First Amendment rights, but it's a question of action. And in this particular case, it's her actions and whether or not the words that she used were tantamount to somebody really assisting somebody in committing suicide. And going way back, as you remember, we had all of these different types of cases with um, physician-assisted suicide, Dr. Dr. Kevorkian, yes. right? And whether or not that was really a mercy killing, given the person's um, physical and um, medical condition at the time, yes. to just what somebody does in assisting someone else to kill themselves for whatever reason. And there are laws that are on the books about what's illegal and what you can't do. So if this girl, it was a girl, yes. um, had been there, turned on the car, helped encourage him to stay in the car, um, when he got out, was there talking to him, sort of nudging him back into the, it was, I think it was a car. I don't Truck. think there would be much question as to whether or not that was um, something or actions that would result in a conviction of the crime. Correct? You agree Correct. with that? So now the question becomes, she's not there, but it's her virtual. words. It's virtual It's now. virtual. And in the judge's opinion, her words were a virtual presence that resulted in his eventually going through with the um, action that he took committing suicide. So. It still brings up lots of questions. So uh, the journalists across the country who made any kind of uh, opinion pieces on this would talk about words really can kill people and words matter. They're fond, journalists are fond of saying that. Um, and there should be some consequences. I think you know most people will say what this girl did, morally reprehensible or ill-advised or whatever else. But legally, could she say? what she did without it causing a problem. At the heart of this, from what I understand, there are hundreds of texts that this girl has had submitted during this trial. And a lot of them say, you know, you really should do it. You're a weakling if you don't. But the judge at that bench trial said, that isn't what was the deciding factor. The deciding factor, getting away from the First Amendment issue here, is that this boy on the phone with her says, I'm not going to do it, and he gets out of the car. She, on the phone, says, go get back in and just do it. Now, does that make her 
coercing him? And even if it, number one, is that legal? Because in Massachusetts, they, I think they do have assisted su suicides like Dr. Kevorkian. Or is she really, uh, is she really involved with manslaughter here? She's, maybe she's just trying to help the kid. Well, she says. The um, actions, uh, you, you would call them words, then they're words, but they're actions. It, it's just like I explained earlier. It's not a lot different from her being there in his face, you know, encouraging him to get back in the car. She's doing it on the phone with him. And it's exactly what I'm saying that the judge would have latched on to as what she did that was wrong. Where, where it differs from just words is there's the relationship that they had, the encouragement that she was giving him to do this, his having a second thought about it, his maybe pulling away from doing it, but her encouraging and pushing him to continue on to do what he ended up doing. So that's why the judge went in the direction he did. Other states have um, much more clear statutes on this than the Massachusetts law. The Massachusetts law wasn't very clear as to whether or not what she did would be enough to convict her of the crime. The judge found, just for the very fact pattern that you gave, the fact that he was pulling away from doing it, that her presence was a virtual presence that encouraged him to go back and do it, even though he was having second thoughts, was enough in that judge's mind to convert her under the Massachusetts statute. What's manslaughter? So it's the um, taking of a life. It's not a premeditated murder type of situation, but it's the unlawful taking of a life. And in this particular instance, what the judge is saying is that her actions were really the precipitating factor for the unlawful taking of the life. If the boy had stayed in the car and said, yep, I'm doing this, this is my decision, no one else is influencing me in making this decision, then her actions would be irrelevant to the whole thing. And that was sort of her defense. He was going to do this anyway. My actions, my words, they're irrelevant to what he did. It was, I, I'm not an intervening cause. I'm not the causal um, connection between, my words weren't the causal connection between what happened and what he did, he was going to do it anyway. But the judge found that her words were the causal connection. Her, her words were the reason that there was an unlawful taking of somebody's life. How does intent factor into this? Hers. What was the charge? Manslaughter. But which one? Voluntary or involuntary? Involuntary. So in involuntary manslaughter, intent really generally um, isn't the big factor in there. It's the actions of what she did. In this particular case, though, what other intent could she have had other than the result that came? So that brings up much of what goes on here. Initially, I opened up with, let's talk about free speech, David. I can say, jump off the bridge, you're not going to, you know, sticks and stones, and there are, we can have that conversation. But there was, throughout this case, hundreds of texts that attest to the fact that she was supporting him and saying, yes, your parents will understand, they know, you've talked about suicide before, it's been an email, your parents have seen it, they said nothing. Mm -hmm. I think that they would not be surprised, they would be understanding, they'd be hurt, they'd get over, all of these kinds of things. But there was also texts and uh, phone messages, apparently, I guess they must have recorded some of them somehow, I don't know who did, that also said she was trying and pleading with him to get help. So. That's not supporting involuntary or voluntary or any kind of manslaughter, much less murder, which is not the issue here. But she was trying to be supportive of this kid for the longest time. And I don't know if there was a boyfriend or a friend, but in either case, there was a close um, relationship right. enough for them to say coercive that she had an influence over him. So, so let me just be clear on one thing. I'm commenting in general yes. on what may or may not have happened in this case in particular because I don't know all of the facts. I don't know every piece of testimony or piece of evidence that the judge heard. So I don't know exactly everything that went into it. But what I can say is that if she, you know, had some evidence that she didn't intend for this to happen and there was some evidence that she did intend for this to happen, that's what the judge has to pass out in making a decision because there was no jury in this case. Right. So just like a jury would have to do, the judge has to decide which evidence is more persuasive to him in determining what the intent was, what her actions were, what 
is or is not relevant to the charge that was made. And so without commenting on the evidence, since I don't know any of it, I can just tell you the process as to how the judge would have arrived at the decision that the judge made. Now on appeal, it's up to the appellate court to decide whether or not the judge applied the facts that he found correctly to the law as it applies to this case. And certainly from uh, what I had read from many of these different accounts, there was support on both sides of it, where she clearly was trying to support him, get him help, sympathized, empathized, pleaded with him to get help. Then on the other side of it, maybe she was exasperated. They said something about her being a possible uh, drama queen that she wanted attention brought to herself that's selfish and that's yeah. stupid but I don't know is even that illegal I don't know if it is but right. if you have facts on both side of, sides of it where she's coercing them and say you're a wuss you're a whatever it is go ahead and do it you've been after you've been wanting to you've been wanting to tough to weigh that out clearly well th that's true in almost every case many many cases there's contradictory evidence or facts that can look at um, something from one side or the other and that's what makes the jury system or trial by a judge a very interesting and um, unpredictable process because you don't know if it's a jury in particular which facts the jury is going to latch on to, which ones they're going to find more persuasive, which um, way a jury is going to go. We've had many famous trials where you have expert pundits sitting there trying to predict what a jury is going to do. and they can flip a coin and be right as often as they can be just trying to analyze what a jury is looking at. Well, apparently there was also a, a, an occasion where somebody who was in jail was then held um, for murder for having said to one of his friends, I think you should hang yourself because he was on death row and he, the guy did hang himself and now a murder charge is on top of everything else that was going. So here's an occasion where what someone says was held, was making him held accountable. Is that yeah. inciting? That's not inciting, is it, David? Well, I'm not 100% following exactly what happened, so this was two in the prison? Are in, two people are in prison, one is on death row. The friend, supposedly the friend, says, you should just kill yourself, why don't you go hang yourself before they do that to you, and the man did. So, a one-time comment. If it's a one-time comment, um, I don't think that that's enough of a factual basis to charge somebody with. It's a little bit, and I don't, I think we've talked about this before, someone being on a bridge and they're holding up traffic and as the cars go by, someone yells, why don't you just <laughs> jump already? Are we gonna hold that person responsible? Not knowing any of the facts, no relationship between that person and the person who's on the side of the bridge if, if they ended up jumping? I don't think so. But it does go back to my point about two things in the other case. It's the relationship and it's the action. And so what action did they take besides just the words? And to, very recently, um, I re, there was a story, I don't know if you saw this, about an umpire um, from a baseball, um, Major League Baseball in Pittsburgh, where there was a woman, he was just walking back, walking maybe to the stadium, and she was on the wrong side of the bridge. She was going to jump and he talked her off of it, put his arms around her and pulled her back to the right side. So those are the kinds of actions you would rather see people take in Certainly. those situations. And um, the umpire got the call right in that particular case. But it, just by way of example, if someone else had been driving by, as I said, and encouraged her to, hey, just go already, you know, wrong thing to do, but not criminal probably. If the umpire didn't stop, and try to help her. Did he do something criminal? Probably not, but he did the right thing, very much so. So actions are very important in the equation of trying to figure out what the words are intended to do and, and what they mean to the person who's hearing them. Certainly, you brought up earlier the uh, virtual presence idea. With texts back and forth, it's as if I'm right there, but even if I were right there, isn't there some um, right to privacy that we can have a conversation? I understand, David, you've had an awful time, but I understand why you want to kill yourself. That's a terrible thing, terrible, terrible thing to say, even if you want to empathize yeah. with someone because it's good to empathize. Certainly, her decisions, <laughs> She's a young person, she doesn't understand, she maybe troubled herself, numerous options in there. Do you think that it makes sense that there could be manslaughter with a 
um, jail sentence attached to it? So, again, I don't know the facts of this case well enough to tell you what the result should be, so I'll talk hypothetically. Fair enough. If there were mitigating circumstances in this particular, in a case like this particular one, where um, these two people had many conversations back and forth and there was encouragement to do something, encouragement to get help, encouragement to do other things and the piece of evidence that is the critical piece for someone to latch on to to convict her of doing what she did is only one small piece of the puzzle, then there's a lot of alternatives to prison that might be more appropriate than prison in that particular instance. Do you think that texting and phones now are setting the bar, changing the nature of these conversations about how much, well in this case, how much input she had over what period of time and what was, what transpired between the two. If that hadn't been texted, you wouldn't have known there were a hundred texts, sometimes when she's pleading with him to stay, then she's telling him jump already or whatever, not jump, but do it already. Certainly creates a much easier trail for a prosecutor to yes. establish and follow. Uh, in the old days, you know, like when I was a kid, um, we had telephones with wires and those kind of things. And unless someone was wiretapping it, you know, recording it or whatever, and that, that's why they use that word wiretap, because she actually tapped Tap. into a wire, you wouldn't know what the conversation was about. The police might have been able to establish there were 57 phone calls in three days but what was discussed without you know without a no recording one. no one would know with text messaging there's a trail that a prosecutor can follow now so certainly at least on an evidentiary basis there's a lot more evidence that can be obtained in trying to figure out what happened in some kind of circumstance when it's a young person we talked uh, about justice reform for juveniles i think very recently mm -hmm. so when it's a young person clearly perhaps immature at one end of the spectrum, perhaps even very troubled herself at the second, um, is if you were the lawyer who's doing the appeal of this, would you um, use either of those issues to weigh in on her behalf? Well, here's the thing. Those are kinds of issues that would be really important for the judge to hear before sentencing someone. Whether or not they're relevant to the appeal is more questionable because were they facts that were brought up and discussed at trial so that the judge in making the determination or if there had been a jury, the jury could have weighed those issues. If they weren't brought up at trial, there's an often used expression, raise it or waive it. If you don't raise the issue at trial, you waive the issue on appeal. The appeals court cannot, and they're not supposed to at least, look to facts or other evidence that wasn't adduced at trial. So if it wasn't raised at trial, their hands are supposed to be tied in terms of looking at that kind of stuff. But as you said, those are all really mitigating factors that might be very important to a judge when sentencing someone. Good points of law to know, David. Thank you. Thank you. How about in Massachusetts, um, if the fact remains that there's not um, a law that criminalizes encouraging or assisting suicide? If that's the case, then w what's the manslaughter issue about in the first place? If she's, even if she did absolutely assist, if we're going to credit her with the assist, as they say, if it's, not a, if it's not a crime, then what's the manslaughter charge based on? How does that work, David? That's going to be the legal issue that's raised, and that's going to be what I think would be the real crux of the appeal. Truly, okay. As to whether or not the facts as established meet the law as it was applied by the judge. And that is a very um, reasonable issue for an appeals court to look at because the appeals court's not looking at the facts um, to determine whether or not the judge determined the facts correctly. They're looking to determine whether the judge applied the law correctly. And that has always been, in this particular case, one of the big issues as to whether or not these facts apply to the law or, as I should say, the charges that were brought against her. And then the law that the judge used to convict her. So the appeals court may very well find that the legislature can pass a law that 
prohibits this kind of action, but do they think that the law that's already on the books applies or doesn't apply? Do you think that this is going to end up becoming an issue for legislators because so many of these things are likely to happen and continue happening? I do think so. In, a, in this particular case, I think it will really either spur the legislature on in Massachusetts to do something or not if the conviction is upheld. I think if it's overturned because the Supreme Court or the appellate court says, no, this doesn't apply, um, this law doesn't fit these facts, the legislature might say, well, we really don't want to have that gap. We want to fill it in with some new law. It's interesting. So not surprisingly, when I was doing some prep work for this, I saw under the listing in Wiki, what oh, Wikipedia, what First Amendment is and when there are exceptions. There are some limitations to that free speech and you could certainly tick sure. those off. But it was very interesting that it's a new edition, but the story was listed about what's going on here, which is on appeal with this gal, Michelle Carter. So it's saying that clearly there must be some clarification needed because it's not it's First Amendment issue. It's not a First mm -hmm. Amendment issue. And we're talking right now about it not even being a First Amendment issue. It's about something else yeah. entirely. So, so there's some clarification I, that's necessary. I, I do think um, that the case we've been discussing really has very little to do with First Amendment rights. First Amendment rights and protection of free speech. As you said, there are limitations on protection of free speech, but it's really more of governmental limiting free speech, not what you can and yes. cannot say to another person. Yes. For example, defamation. You can't come and say, well, that's free speech. If you are defaming somebody or slander, libel, whatever it may yes. be, you don't have the right to say something about somebody that's defamatory um, and say, well, but my right to say it's protected by free speech because it's not. You don't have the right to, what's the big one they always say, go into a crowded movie theater and yell, yell fire. fire. Right? There are things that you can and not, cannot say, not because of the First Amendment, but because of different laws that apply to limit what you can say about somebody or say that might cause injury or those types of things. Of course, law um, advertising certainly has some First Amendment issues. Uh, it, there are issues about uh, what I can say about a politician that I may or may not like mm -hmm. and whose views I may or might, may not subscribe to. But so certainly. advertising is protected by free speech, but it's also limited by not being able to tell things that aren't true. So you can be held liable um, if your advertising is false. So let's get back to what her options might have been. If you're, a, I assume whether you're a judge and you have to look at law, you also look at what human nature and what people are about. If you are the bench judge on this situation, you see a young person who is clearly um, distraught herself, uh, has her own issues. At some point, does that in any way factor into what you're going to say about what should happen here. Listen, what she did was reprehensible, it's uh, immature, it's uh, many other things, So, but we shouldn't really plan on calling this manslaughter. Do you have that, do you really get to weigh that at all or is it just the facts, ma'am, just the facts? No, I mean, I think there, those issues can come, as I said, in, in different ways. If um, the judge in weighing the facts of the case in determining whether or not a crime was committed feels that those issues or factors are part of what went into this and whether or not they should override. For, let me give you a different hypothetical. Um, if somebody is charged with murder, um, first degree murder, and there's a, which requires premeditation and all of those things, and they didn't have the mental capacity to come to the ability to under or, or mental capacity because of um, insanity, which is a, okay. a defense. Defense, sure. So their mental capacity their, or their um, mental state becomes an issue that the court definitely can look at as a defense. So those things can be weighed as defenses in the right circumstances. But if it's really a matter of degree of intent or something of that nature, which may not be a factor in determining the guilt, it certainly could be a factor in determining the sentence. 
Because they do say that there's certainly a host of alternatives or options that they have, even probation or counseling. I'm sure she needs counseling anyway. Yeah. But from jail to probation to counseling right. and anything in and, between. And we talked about alternative sentencing very recently and looking at the crime, the um, person who committed the crime, what needs or issues that they may have, and whether or not there's an alternative to jail that's more appropriate given the circumstances. Could you give a comment about, maybe it's, it is 2020 high, hindsight. Before this, took before this um, trial took place, if you were representing this girl, could you have started or set this up in a different way so that it never had to be an issue about whether or not there's um, manslaughter? Could it have been couched and presented in a different way so this would not have come to this? From the prosecutor's issue? side or the defense side? You're the defense. I attorney. usually am. Yes. Well, you don't have any control over what your client's charged with. Right. So you have to deal with what's put on the table. I don't know what more they could have done if they weren't able to come to some kind of agreement, plea agreement, to resolve it. So it takes two to agree or two to tango, yes, to, tango. to resolve um, a charge. So they could have said, I don't know what happened, but the defense attorney could have presented some alternatives, such as, you know, reduce the charge to something else and, and have an alternative sentence, such as uh, probation with counseling or whatever. I don't know what happened in that case, but that in a hypothetical situation is what could have happened. But if the prosecutor in the state of Massachusetts knows that manslaughter and, and um, assisted suicide is acceptable, it's not illegal, why wouldn't, why would they want to go through bringing it to trial? Why wouldn't there have been a real reason, unless they wanted to make it a legislative issue going no, forward? No, I, I, I think the prosecutor in this case felt that the facts rose to the level of manslaughter. Really? Um, assisted okay. suicide really, uh, when you're talking about assisted suicide as being a, a legal thing to do, under it's different, not, totally different circumstances, it's when someone's got a terminal illness, no hope right. of recovery, and all those things. We That's didn't true. have that here, so it's totally different. So the prosecutor is not looking at that. The prosecutor is saying, "Do we have facts that rise to the level that would sustain a charge of manslaughter?" And at least in the judge's eyes, who heard the case, it did. Certainly, we know that it's on appeal. There'll be plenty more news following this. We thank you for tuning in to The Law Matters. There'll be many similar issues that I'm sure we're going to be discussing. Thanks for tuning in to The Law Matters because it matters to you.